This is Rob from Auburn Amps with another under the hood look at Science Hub. Two design amplifiers. And today, why don't we look at uh, filaments? It's an aspect of tubes and filament. Why do they light up when they're on? Let's find out. Filaments today on under the hood. In a tube guitar amp, filaments and their associated wiring might seem like an unexciting necessity without much bearing on the amp's performance, but we're going to look at some things that could challenge that notion. First, what is a filament? It's a little tungsten wire inside a tube that glows bright orange when enough current is passing through it. It's sometimes called a heater, and that's exactly what it does. Its job is to heat the oxide-coated cathode so that the cathode emits the electrons responsible for current flow in the tube. The filament operates at about 1,000 degrees Celsius, or 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you know why tubes get so hot. The energy consumed by these heaters is a significant component of an amp's total energy consumption. Even in a small amp, the filaments might be consuming a total of around 10 watts just to keep the cathodes at their operating temperature. Filaments are heated by the action of passing a current through a resistance. If you're interested, you can figure out what that resistance is from a tube's data sheet. Looking at a 12AX7, we see the filament consumes 150 milliamps, or 0.15 amps, from a 12.6 volt supply. Ohm's law says dividing voltage by current gives a resistance. 12.6 divided by 0.15 is 84 ohms. But if you try to measure that resistance with your meter, you'll get a much lower figure, as little as 10 ohms. This is because the filament has a much lower resistance when it's cold, which means that it draws more current when you first turn it on. We'll see why this is important in a moment. Different tube types require different filament voltages. On American tube types, the first number in the tube's name is the filament voltage. A 12AX7 has a 12-volt filament, 12.6 actually, and a 6L6 has a 6-volt filament, 6.3 actually. So why are they all wired together to a single 6.3 volt supply in most amps? Those 12 volt tubes have two 6 volt filaments in series, which can be wired in parallel for 6 volt operation. That's why pins 4 and 5 are typically tied together on preamp tubes in most amps. Filaments in European tube types that begin with the letter E, like EL84 or ECC83, can be operated on 6 volts, although some have this same series option for 12 volt operation. Figuring out how much current your filament supply will have to provide is simple. Just add up all the currents on the tube data sheets and add a healthy margin of safety to allow for variations in tube types and other variables. Now how critical is it for the filament voltage to be accurate? 6.3 volts sounds pretty precise. The answer is not very. Looking again at a data sheet, we see a spec of plus or minus 10%. So anything from roughly 5.7 to 6.9 volts will allow the average 6.3 volt tube to operate within spec. There's not much to be gained by operating tubes at a higher filament voltage, and doing so can dramatically shorten tube life. Unfortunately, this is exactly how tubes might be operated inside some early amps that were built when the incoming AC was lower than it is now. And because the tube filament supply is almost always derived from a winding on the power transformer, it's subject to not only regular voltage variations, but also to power line surges and noise. Why should we care about noise on a supply that's just heating up some tungsten? The proximity of the various elements inside the tube can capacitively couple that power line noise to the signal path. And the last thing a tube amp needs is another noise source. You'll notice that the filament wiring in most amps is usually twisted and routed away from the signal wires, often at right angles. These techniques help lower the amount of hum introduced to the audio paths by the filament circuit. If you're building an amp, never bundle the filament wires with signal wires, no matter how tidy you think it looks. Keeping the filament wiring separate can reduce hum to acceptable levels, but it can't do anything about coupling that occurs within the tube itself. There's a solution to the filament hum problem that wasn't viable in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when the classic tube guitar amps were made, and that is to use a DC filament supply. Even when electrolytic capacitors that were large enough to do this finally came available, they were so expensive that no manufacturer would ever consider using them. But when desktop computers came along, suddenly there was a need for compact, reliable, low-voltage, high-current power supplies. 
These are called switching power supplies because they use high-speed switching to boost transformer efficiency. This technology got another shot in the arm when LED lighting and signs hit the big time. So now we have high current, low voltage DC switching power supplies designed for continuous use in harsh environments. Uh, granted, you won't find many with 6 volt outputs, but 12 volt supplies are very common. And in an amp with two output tubes, their 6 volt filaments can be wired in series. We've already talked about common preamp tubes being designed to run on 6 or 12 volts. And our 12 volt DC supply is just 5% below 12.6 volts, so it's well within spec. The great news is that the tubes will also last longer at this reduced voltage. And switching power supplies do a great job of isolating the load from power line surges and noise. Now some people are against the idea of using switching power supplies in any kind of audio equipment for two main reasons. One, a switching power supply is a much more complicated device than the winding on a power transformer, so there are more things in it to go wrong. Two, they worry about the switching frequency, which is typically around 100 kHz, somehow affecting the audio path. And it's true there are still some cheap, unreliable, noisy switching power supplies out there that tend to prolong the bad reputation this technology had in the 80s. But the truth is that those fears don't stack up against the reality of the last 20, 30 years, when excellent switching power supplies have been readily available. They're used in life support systems now. The only real problem with using a switching power supply for tube heaters is the low resistance of the cold filaments we talked about earlier. When an amp is switched on, those filaments could be drawing over six times their rated current, at least momentarily. Power supplies designed for LED signs don't have to deal with large inrush currents, so they don't. They just shut down and keep retrying until the load is within their spec. That is not a nice way to treat a tungsten filament, pulsing it with full power every second or so until its resistance has come down low enough for the power supply to be happy. One way around this would be to simply use a bigger power supply. If the tubes in your design will require a total of one amp of filament current, use a 10 amp supply. This approach has an advantage in that such a lightly loaded supply would probably last a very long time. But keep in mind that switching power supplies have a minimum load spec too. And besides, having a power supply with 10 times the needed power is probably overkill. Another solution is to put a small value resistor in series with the filament supply, and this creates a voltage divider. As an example, a half ohm resistor in a filament chain that is normally drawing one amp will drop half a volt and dissipate half a watt. But when that amp is first turned on, the extra current drawn through that resistor will make it drop several volts, giving those filaments a softer start and reducing the startup load on the power supply. This is essentially what's happening inside an old-style tube amp, with the resistance of the transformer winding providing some current limiting. The only problem is that once the amp is warmed up, that resistor is just wasting power. A solution to this problem that has been around for a long time comes in the form of a component called a thermistor, a temperature-sensitive resistor. Now, all resistors are sensitive to temperature, but in the thermistor this effect is emphasized and its temperature is affected by the amount of current flowing through it. If you put one of these with a negative temperature coefficient, which just means that as the temperature rises, the resistance goes down, if you put one of these in series with the heater supply instead of the fixed resistor we tried before, the voltage across it will be at its highest when the filament resistances are at their lowest, i.e. when the amp is cold. But when the filaments warm up, the voltage across the varistor is reduced and its resistance slowly goes down until it's typically just a fraction of an ohm. This provides an even softer start for the filaments and less strain on the power supply. But we still have the problem of a power wasting resistance remaining in the filament circuit after its work is done. To get around this, there's this neat little circuit I use in Auburn and QB amps, as well as the ones I designed for Hofner. It's such a simple circuit that's probably lurking in the back of an old tube book somewhere, although I've never actually seen it used anywhere else. So, we like the way the varistor works, but we'd ideally like it to be out of the circuit once the filaments have reached their operating temperature. Now we could bypass it with a transistor that was biased to turn on when the voltage across the filaments reached a certain level.
but there's an even simpler one component solution, a relay. That's a voltage operated electromechanical switch. With its coil in parallel with the filaments and its normally open contacts across the varistor, like so, the relay pulls in when the voltage across the filaments reaches the relay's minimum activation voltage, which is usually around 9 or 10 volts for a 12 volt relay. Now this closes the contacts and bypasses the varistor. And with that much tungsten across the relay coil, you don't even need the usual suppression diode to shunt the voltage spike caused by the collapsing magnetic field when the relay opens. The filaments will do that. Well, there you have it. If you've got any questions about filaments or heater supplies and tube amps, just fire them to me in the comments below or let me know if I've missed something. And please feel free to like this video or to subscribe to this channel. I try to cover topics that are of interest to people who build or modify guitar amps or people who are just interested in how their gear works. That was our look at filaments. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll be back with another under the hood look at the science and technology behind two guitar amplifiers. This is Rob from Auburn Amps. We shoot you today full of